So we're here to talk actually about um, advanced fault detection and diagnostics. And it's important to maybe a little, know a little bit more about our background and the way we approach it. The HVAC industry is very broad, covers lots of different kinds of systems. In our core business, we deal with many of those systems, but our area of actually kind of domain knowledge or expertise happens to deal with one type of HVAC system. And so our company, Transformative Wave, is the technology arm of a 30-year-old uh, design-build HVAC service contracting firm in the Seattle, Washington area. In fact, in November, we'll celebrate our 30th birthday. And so uh, we have about 35 to 40 service technicians. Um, in fact, that's my background. I came up through the ranks uh, as a technician, learned how to learn the HVAC, the, the refrigeration cycle, and how to read a wiring diagram, fixing window air conditioners in Tulsa, Oklahoma when I was about 20 years old or something. So we've applied our specific product that I'll tell you a little bit more about here in a moment to thousands of rooftop units. And we'll explain more about what we mean by RTUs in a moment. But we have a lot of field experience and we also have a tremendous amount of data that we've collected through our technology. And a lot of that sort of serves as the background for our experience and for, for, for our expertise in this area. And uh, so the most important thing to know is that we're not, the we're not, it's not a theoretical thing for us. This is based upon real life experience that we have in the field, what we want to talk about here, here today. And so to explain a little bit more about our technology, I'll show you a photo here in a moment. But the, the, uh, the product, we, we call it the Catalyst, and it's a retrofit kit for rooftop package units. So 70% of all the commercial floor space in North America and over almost 60% of the buildings are served by rooftop package constant volume HVAC systems. In fact, if you have food service, if you have um, their theaters and retail, it's huge in retail, of course, they're very simple HVAC systems in a box. And you can put them on your roof and cut a hole in the roof and, and bring the ductwork down, and they tend to be primarily single zone systems. But they're very, very common because they're low first cost. and uh, you don't have to be a design mechanical and have the sophistication and capabilities they have. Almost any contracting firm can install these in a commercial setting, and, and many do. So they're, they're rampant, they're everywhere. And so our product was designed to be a retrofit energy efficiency solution for these systems. They're inherently oversized because we design them for the worst day of the year. And then we do lighting upgrades in our buildings, and then we need even less cooling than we did before. And so part of what the, pro the Catalyst product does is that it just, it adds a VFD, it adds about five new sensors to every unit. It's a retrofit kit that can be installed in about three hours by two technicians. It's all pre-wired, pre-programmed, ready to go. And it's a product that Design Mechanical is our local representative here in the Kansas City um, area, in fact, this whole region, and doing a great job for us. So uh, that product has been found to reduce overall HVAC energy use by 57% uh, by the Department of Energy. We generally um, tell customers they can expect about a 25 to 50% um, reduction in their HVAC energy bill. So it's been widely vetted and, and uh, we worked with the National Renewable Energy Lab at, in Pearl Harbor. I had to go do those installations, Tom. Couldn't leave that to just anybody in the organization to go I to Hawaii. Take the sword for you. Yeah, I know you would have done that one. And you had the skills. But part of our model is, and in fact, there's a link there if you want to read that study, you can read the study. But part of our model is that we use the energy savings to pay for the smarts that come with our system. So we have a thing we call the EIQ platform. And it's just a way for us to, over the internet, now connect to these package units that are on the roof. So you can see them on your tablet or your smartphone. So a lot of the things we do in our home where we're making appliances a lot more intelligent and they're becoming web enabled and a part of the internet of things. And if you haven't heard that term, you'll hear that term a lot in the coming years because it's just, a, it's considered the third wave of sort of technology um, evolution where we started out with a P PC and then you had the internet that changed everything. The internet of things, smart connected machines and appliances and the data that comes from that. There's a reason why Google spent, what, $3.2 billion or whatever it was to buy the Nest thermostat. Because data um, about, uh, is, has got a lot of value in the, f in the future. And there's a lot, um, a lot that we're doing in that area that relates to smart grid integration. 
So getting connected buildings and getting connected appliances that use energy so you can do load curtailment and you can manage them more effectively over the internet is, is, is kind of that frontier that we're a part of with the product as well. So we get a lot of data that we're collecting. We get 40 points of data out of every HVAC unit with our product and we store it in one minute intervals in the cloud so there's lots of, of information there. And then we apply fault detection and diagnostic tech te techniques to these systems, which is uh, our subject here today. And if you're not familiar with automated demand response or ADR, it's just a, it's a way to curtail the loads in response to a utilities um, request that you reduce your energy use. And so our product is ADR uh, capable. So that's a little bit about the technology the lights may have some of this washed out a bit, but I think you can see it. You'll notice here that um, we have an antenna here. So when we, because we're a retrofit solution, when we get on a rooftop, we can do really large sites. We've done sites as large as 1.8 million square feet in Chicago in a manufacturing facility and without running any wires. So we just use Wi-Fi on the roof and, an, and a, uh, a hub and spoke concept and then we can avoid the need to run all that cabling to devices. And it turns out to be a very reliable way for these devices to communicate um, themselves. And this is a, we do everything through a box. Everything goes into the kit for a complete installation. And this is like a, a train unit where you can see the controller, the pre-wire controllers mounted on the side of the unit. There's a little conduit here. And we provide, uh, every cable has a unique uh, color so that it becomes very repeatable and very predictable in terms of the way we deploy this product on these simple HVAC systems. So we, uh, we can talk about this in the context of RTUs, rooftop units. We can actually talk about any kind of HVAC system. Um, it, actually, uh, well, these same concepts apply. When we talk about the, the, the uh, um, rooftop unit efficiency, which again is what we um, generally focus on with our product. The first step towards efficiency is to optimize what you have. And so we'll call this recommissioning or there'll be tune-up programs, but the factory level performance is where you'd like to have clean coils, you want to make sure your airflow is optimized, the refrigerant charge is correct, that all the things that are a part of that machine, the best day it ever had leaving the factory, you want to try to restore that. And that's, that's a bit of an ongoing challenge in its own right. Part of the problem with rooftop units is that they're on the roof. And the other problem with them is they're on buildings that generally don't have what I think some of you in the room are, facility engineers, whose job it is is to watch over the HVAC systems and probably other assets within a more complex facility. These systems find their ways into places and facilities that don't have designated professional staff to watch over them. So you rely on service technicians, but they may only be there once a quarter. They may be there once, uh, once every six months. So there's a certain amount of degradation that we'll talk about here in a bit. But the, the goal of optimizing or just doing a good tune-up and, and getting it back to factory level, kind of a recommissioning process is the first step. And then we talk about the, the, the concept of upgrading. And so with us, our product is a hardware upgrade. The energy savings is in the hardware. It changes the way the unit um, operates. So we get a whole new energy profile that's um, different than the factory ever envisioned with that unit. We're going to use 25 to 50 percent less energy as a result of this retrofit solution. And there are things like that. Many of you have probably done if you're in facilities that use pumps or, or other kinds of fan systems, you've probably applied VFDs to those and you've seen energy savings as a result. It wasn't the original configuration, it was just part of an upgrade. Big VAV systems that used to use inlet vane dampers, we go back and retrofit those with, with a drive, it's the same concept. So there's an actual hardware upgrade that we do to, um, to now get us to a different level of efficiency. But the, the sort of the, the big pursuit is how do we perpetuate that outcome? This is the problem that we have in our industry. It's the problem that we have with controls upgrades and with we recommission and then we find ourselves back sometimes to where we started. The energy efficiency industry, we've been at this now for almost six and a half years. The first four and a half years of that were spent not so much with end use customers, but with the efficiency community, the Department of Energy and the major utilities across the United States trying to build support for this efficiency measure 
that we call RTU retrofit. And when you, you, you begin to learn how utilities fund different kinds of efficiency initiatives, and part of the problem they have with controls upgrades, they'll tend not to give you incentives for those. And there's a reason, they don't have any confidence that the savings will persist. Because you go and you reset your controls all up, you get everything configured the way you want it, and they just, the, 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 the data and the evidence shows that this concept of entropy, this decay begins to set back in almost immediately after you, after you configure. And so it's just a challenge to keep chasing that sort of gold at the end of the rainbow is that if you could do these things, optimize a unit, these systems, and do some kind of upgrade, and then have it as a permanent outcome, it would be great. And then they'd pay for it. <laughs> but they don't have a lot of confidence. So um, maybe somebody can name a, an energy efficiency measure. There's kind of an obvious one here, but an energy efficiency measure where the utilities don't have to worry about degradation. There's certain kinds of things that can be done that they'll incentivize for that they have a lot of confidence that it's going to last. Can anybody name one of them? What's that? VFD's one, yep. Of course, the VFD could be overridden, I guess. So there's always a possibility it could potentially be undone. But lighting's one of the most obvious ones because when you change your light bulbs or change your fixtures, you've got a permanent change there that you're not likely to go back and put that old ballast in, right? So they get spoiled with these kinds of things that they can say, well, that's a, that's a concrete measure change that we're going to see the light, the, the watts per square feet go down on these facilities and they can count on it. They have a hard time uh, hanging their hat on this idea that we're going to be able to perpetuate any kind of energy savings outcome that's associated with controls of almost any kind. This is the book that Valerie was referencing that um, I was asked to write a chapter in, Automated Diagnostics and Analytics for Buildings. It's a book that came out just a little less than a year ago. I think a year ago, October. It's very expensive. I actually, I think, sent a copy. I can get you, if you want to read it, you can get my copy. I, can, I can't share all of them, but I can share at least the one that I wrote. If you're interested in any of that, we can send you the electronic version. And Valerie and the team here have that. But this is uh, a, an indication that in our industry of energy efficiency, um, there's a real strong interest in this area of fault detection and diagnostics, automated fault detection and diagnostics. So this is something, this is a concept that I had in, the, in my chapter that um, I'll just share with you. And this is what I call the efficiency investment cycle, which is this, uh, um, this pattern that we often see where an organization, a corporation, a business may have a focus on how do we lower our energy expense. And so they have a real interest in seeing some things change there. Maybe they hire consultants. Maybe they have their internal staff go out and try to find ideas about what can we do with our facility to lower our energy spend. And so there's sort of this drive sometimes from the top to help improve the energy efficiency of facilities. And so they'll do audits, um, hire folks in to kind of try to identify a list of energy efficiency measures that might be appropriate that could be done for their facility. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing those of us that are service providers in the HVAC um, industry will often serve our customers in that way. Um, and then you know, budgets are created, you fund those measures, they get deployed, they get implemented, and then you see almost an immediate impact in the energy bills, and everybody's all excited. And then this happens, this concept of entropy, which is just the, what, second law of thermodynamics that say that things go from a state of order to a state of disorder. And, and that's it's an inevitable law of the universe that, unfortunately, we see it in our bodies, we see it in our homes. Um, when I was living at home, my room never, ever um, straightened itself out by itself. Um, Left to itself, it just got worse and worse. The cars that I bought, I wasn't an auto guy, so that law of entropy would set into my vehicles, it seemed like, very, very quickly, and things start falling apart and breaking because I didn't take care of things very well. Um, everything, our, from our bodies to our buildings to um, the, the, the systems that serve those buildings, still has to fight this ongoing battle to stay at some kind of an optimized condition. It just doesn't do it by itself. And so this law of entropy, this decay, 
is the thing that is the challenge, it's the force against which we sort of battle. And as that sits in, and I will say that sometimes it's not just laws of nature, sometimes it's, it's, it's the people that we have. Sometimes un unintentionally well-meaning folks can undo some of the good work that had been done previously out of ignorance perhaps. They don't know that changing that, dot, that dial will have the effect that it has. Sometimes because we see this a lot with RTUs where people will go and disconnect economizers so that they can't use outside air for free cooling because they think they're helping the customers. It's really, really hot and they're struggling to keep up so they do something that maybe when it's 98 degrees and 80% humidity makes sense, but in the fall when conditions get like this, when outside air can be your friend and can be a favorable cooling resource, now all of a sudden you've screwed yourself. You can't use that for free cooling. Now you're going to make cold air all the time. And so there are these consequences sometimes that happen as a result of human activity or human agency. And sometimes people are just not well informed or they're not well trained. And that's where organizations and companies like Design Mechanical that care about training, that care about the quality of their workmanship and that have an intelligent workforce um, can make a big difference in that area. And so because the benefits eventually erode, you kind of go right back to the same starting point at some point. And this is sort of this pursuit of savings persistence. That's what the utilities will talk to you about. They want the persistence of savings and that's sort of the goal. We want these outcomes to last. So um, what is advanced fault detection and diagnostics? Well, this is just a dis the little definition that I came up with. But I describe it as intelligent systems at the machine or the enterprise level that are able to anticipate, detect, diagnose, sometimes correct, and then notify of issues that impact either performance, efficiency, or comfort. So we like to make a distinction between efficiency and performance. A unit that has a compressor that has failed is very efficient. It doesn't use much electricity because it's broken, right? I mean, the most efficient system that any of you have on any of your properties or that any of you will ever serve is the unit that has been shut off on a disconnect or is broken otherwise. It doesn't come on. It doesn't use any electricity. So from an efficiency standpoint, you get a big A. But when it comes to performance, you flunk because you're not getting the cooling, you're not getting the dehumidification, you're not getting that equipment's there to serve a useful purpose. And whether it's for your employees, whether it's for your guests, whether it's for the processes that you, we were with a group this morning that is involved where humidity matters back in their big warehouse because they do injection molding or something. And so sometimes their product is dependent upon the environment being in certain conditions. And so if the system's not performing right, that's a problem. And so automated fault detection and diagnostics isn't just about efficiency, it's also about performance. And that's the balance we want to, we want to try to find, where we can get the system operating at its, at its sort of maximum potential with the least amount of energy. And so that's the difference between performance and efficiency. And of course, comfort is really key. We work with a lot of retailers. Um, We've been blessed as our business has taken off and as, as, as word about our technology is spread, we're working with, um, we've done the national rollout with like Whole Foods, we work with Walmart, Staples, many large retailers, uh, fitness, fitness centers that you would all be familiar with. And, and the internal conditions for a grocery store and what they're concerned about may vary from what the fitness center is interested in or restaurants, we work with many, uh, Boston Market, we've done McDonald's, we've done um, Buffalo Wild Wings, Panda Express, there's a, there's a lot of them. A lot of times their concern is about air balance, so people can open the door because <laughs> they got exhaust fans going in the kitchen and we deal with that with our product, but also they, they, it's about guest comfort. I don't know how many of you ever walked into a, a facility where that you came in, especially a restaurant, where you came to sit down and enjoy a good meal. And if it's uncomfortable, if it's uneven, then you, sometimes you just turn around and walk right out. Theaters, same kind of thing. Nobody wants to sit through a two-hour movie and be funky. And so comfort matters because for many of our customers, 
that's the revenue, that's where the revenue, it rests and it depends upon. Okay. Sometimes the attitudes we have about our own workers or about our own staff is one thing, but when it comes to the public and there are guests, then maximizing comfort is just as important or more important than efficiency. Because if they're, if they're not buying what you're selling, the cost far exceeds whatever, your, um, whatever benefit you might have from having an efficient system. So these, things, these three things are ultimately what automated fault detection and diagnostics is all about. So anyhow, that's the little definition that I put together on this. And so here's a few of the things that we think are kind of the value of automated fault detection and diagnostics. And in a moment, I'll show you uh, some examples of what we do and you'll see some of it in real time. So it can break this sort of cycle of frustration and wasted investment that if you apply it and it's utilized, and that's key. There's a lot of smarts out there, but if they're not used, right, if they're not, if they're not acted upon, then you don't get any benefit out of it. It's like your vehicle when the dummy light comes on and it says check engine or whatever. Um, I've, I've violated a lot of common sense rules through my life and one of them was not paying attention to that little engine light when I had a, a, a Buick uh, LeSabre and uh, had an uh, aluminum block engine. All that overheating that was going on, the aluminum didn't respond very well to that. There was a whole lot of contraction and stuff going on and that thing shut down and it seized up and the party was over because I didn't pay attention to what was really fault detection, right? Isn't that what the dummy light is? It's a form of fault detection. And that was there to serve me. I didn't listen. I paid a price. So it does need to be there. It needs to be applied and then utilized by decision makers, all right? And another thing that, that good uh, uh, automated fault detection and diagnostics can do, and this applies not just to rooftop units, this is a general concept for any of our, of our uh, mechanical systems, that it kind of helps cut, uh, cut through the clutter and the noise that can help us identify what are the most important things for us to deal with. Those of you who are involved in having to support lots of facilities or lots of systems understand there's only so much time in the day. You gotta prioritize the things that are important. Where are you gonna put your, your resources? Where are you gonna have your partners come in, your service providers come in and focus on? There are lots and lots of issues. And good fault detection helps prioritize the most significant things um, uh, that are in your world that you need to, and it helps prioritize all of that. And then it also puts you a kind of control over your things. You're not really sort of at the mercy of, of, of that law of entropy any longer. You're actually in a position to be in much greater control over your destiny as it goes on. And, and, and honestly, it goes beyond just a lot of the standard building controls or energy management systems we have. Sometimes they're done very, very well. But when it comes to building automation systems, it's, it's only as good as a person who, who programs it and develops it and leverages it. Um, and, and there's some good work done out there, especially with more complex buildings. What we do is sort of a canned solution of fault detection for a certain kind of system. But another key is that you get this sort of proactive push of information to you. And when you have to go, you know, kind of the hunt and peck mindset, you gotta go looking for your problems. That takes time, it takes effort, it's a different kind of challenge. So good fault detection will serve useful information up to you in a way that you can manage and deal with it and you're not running blind anymore. And then there's also beyond the energy benefits or the non-energy benefits that start to, to mount up. And that has to do with other things that affect profitability and system uptime and, and beyond. And, and those are the things, just, just avoiding breakdowns and avoiding catastrophic situations is a, is a big, big part of that process, okay? So this is just an example of, a, of, a, of what we do with fault detection. So each one of these things, this is a picture of an RTU, this is our little graphic that we use. And we've simulated some faults. This says that a sensor's out of range. We have fan belt problem here, and we have drive connections. Now in our little world, when you click on any of these faults, it serves up a troubleshooting guide for you. It tells you or a technician what the most common sources of that problem is and what's the right way to, to, to repair it, and it will tell you um, 
uh, it shows you a wiring diagram of our product and where, say, that sensor terminates. So it, it, we're, we're trying to, again, go beyond just identifying a problem. But here's, here's the, the tools that a technician who's unfamiliar with our, technician, uh, with our technology can use to find the source of the problem and get you back up and going quickly. Now, this fan belt uh, uh, fault, there's an energy signature that we pick up on through um, the catalyst drive, the VFD that's on the supply fan that tells us when fan belts are slipping or if there's anything that's sort of out of alignment in the fan section. And just about three weeks ago, we had, I think, one of the greatest uh, testimonies to the value of that particular fault. And we don't know anybody else who does this, by the way. But um, when that fault is, go is going off, there's a reason for it. There's a problem. It's never been wrong. And the reason is the way that we, we know this energy signature is not normal. And when it's this abnormal, this many times, within a certain period of time, something's, about, something's going wrong. It could be as simple as you just need to go replace your belts because the shivs are worn or the belts are worn. Or it could be, in this example I'm going to give you, large uh, uh, kind of Home Depot competitor that we have in the Seattle area. We've done their portfolio, about seven or eight locations. And we were getting this in their Tacoma location. They said, well, you just send a technician out and tell us what's going on with this fault, why we're getting it. So he went out as a two-year-old, I think 20-ton unit, and the, the main pulley that's on the blower itself, at the factory they had never secured the set screws properly. And this, this big pulley had worked its way all the way to the edge to where it had a half inch left on the shaft. It was almost ready to come off at 1700 and whatever RPM, spinning like crazy. And when that thing came off, the way it was spinning, it was headed right towards the big evaporative, evaporative coil. There was nothing to protect it. And so had this uh, particular fault detection not been in place, they just weren't picking it up. They didn't know. But that was an example of something where fault detection saved them from a kind of a, what would have been a catastrophic event inside of that unit. So while we call it a fan belt fault, it's actually a little bit more than that. And I think that's an example of where you get energy benefits, but you also in this case had a comfort benefit because this big 20 ton system didn't go offline for weeks until you could either replace it or replace the coil, not to mention all the costs associated with that repair. Right? We do a little thing, this thing we developed for staples, but we basically go through each RTU and we decided to give everything a grade in these different categories because all the data we have, we can analyze how effectively systems are working. And then we roll it up to sort of a site level. This is uh, something that we do for, for portfolios. Any customer that has more than one location with our technology automatically gets this in their portal. So when they log on to see their systems, They'll see as many locations as they have. We're running all the analytics in the background. We roll this all up. This is all done in HTML5. So any browser on a phone, smartphone, smart tablet, or, or computer can see this. And what we're doing, whoops, what we're doing here is we've got three categories: energy, health, and comfort. And we think those are the three areas that most folks are, are concerned about. When we colorize something, that means it's a serious problem. If it's in black, uh, non-colorized, it's a moderate fault. So we've kind of prioritized these things. And then we've looked for any comfort out outliers. In this case, they have one location here that has a, is, is really uncomfortable, and it highlighted it. And then here's our energy outliers. And then we total everything down here for them. The concept here is that if you own a chain of furniture stores, you're in the furniture store business. You're not in the HVAC business. They can, at the highest level of their enterprise, go look at one website, and whether you have three locations or you have, like with Walmart, we'll have 125 locations here by the end of the year, you can look at this interface and it will roll up all of your conditions and all of your issues to you in just one simple interface. So whether we're trying to serve the people at the highest level of an enterprise or we're trying to help the person who's actually responsible for fixing it, because when we go down the rabbit hole in this, with this product, you just hold your cursor over it, it'll tell you what the problem is. It'll say, I've got a cooling failure at this store on unit number six. You click on it, it takes you down now into that unit, into the, what we call the tritium world, the, the controls world. And so that's where you can do your diagnostics, 
You can, you can reset things, cycle things off and on. Is there power being consumed and the compressor, so we know the compressor is running and we're not getting good cooling out of it? Or is it being told up to operate and it's not using any energy? Well, now we know the compressor is not running. It's probably off on a safety. That changes how we, who we send and what we send them with when they go out and respond to your site. So these are just concepts where we're trying to say what, based upon the data, based upon the information, based upon the deep reach the technology has into the appliance, and you can only work with what you have. But when we have 40 points of data out of one of these simple systems, there's a lot that can be derived out of it. And these are just ways that we at Transformative Wave and through our partners um, like Design Mechanical, and we have about 85 partners across the country that resell our product and are certified installers of it. This gives them the ability to do what we do nationally with the Staples or with the Whole Foods or whoever it is, they can bring to a local market to multi-site customers on their level. So those are just a few examples there. I'm not going to go through all the details of our fault detection, how it operates. I can do any of that, but I want to make sure I leave a little time here for questions that, that any of you might have on this whole subject. Yes, sir. Okay, I've got, I'm used to dealing with a lot of old dinosaurs. When I got a new building, in fact, they've got tracers on it. And I've learned a lesson. You know, I got about a 30 minute training course in that SC EMS to figure out how to run the thing. So I was in there yesterday. I'm you know, trying to adjust the temperature. And I think we got level eight. And this thing was throwing a level five, not giving no identification. The only other guy that touched it was the IT guy. I went up there. He said, I've never seen that before. No name assignment for override. So I called the guy over the train who I kind of got buddies with. He said, oh, he said, the EMS system is taking control. It's kind of like that Jurassic Park. He didn't say the magic word. He's got more control than you. He couldn't tell me. I didn't know. So how does this interact yeah. with, that, with that thing telling these things to do something and you telling them to do something? Who gets priority or do they work together? Or yeah. Well, well, you're, you're kind of describing a, a situation that's actually fairly common where that um, we run into this as an HVAC service provider where we're there to fix the equipment, but we're not the controls guys because they have train or they have somebody else, could be a supermarket chain and they got Emerson CPC, whatever it is. And so the, t the HVAC guys have to call the controls guys to have them make an adjustment or to test or because there's authority there and it's tough to have any good local authority because with the train tracer system, you, you may or may not have a dial that you can actually affect. A lot of times they're just a blank sensor and, and so you're, you're limited. Maybe you have a push button, right? So the way we, we handle that, at least with our product, is our vision sort of different than a proprietary lock you up thing. And I think that um, this is the way that Design Mechanical approaches their controls outside of what we do. But one thing we've developed is a service switch. And so the service switch is a rotary dial with a magnet on the back, little case, you can show you a picture of it, mounts on the control section. It has th th ultimate authority. So locally, if you want to test the unit, it overrides any of the program, any of the logic, and it says, I want this in cooling stage one, fan at 100%. So the technician can do his work. I'm going to test cooling stage two, and you can do the same. Heat modes, I want to test the economizer. You're done, you put it in the auto mode, and now it goes back to the control system, our product. Now, if you have a problem, you have a bad heat exchanger, and you want to shut the system down, and you don't want us to operate it through the controls, you put it in the off position. But let's just say the technician did what technicians do sometimes and left it in the heat mode. It only stays there for 30 minutes, and then it reverts back to auto in the software. So what we've done is said, okay, what, try to anticipate, what are all the things that can go wrong? Because we shouldn't have ultimate control. There needs to be local control sometimes. So the technician can do whatever he wants to do. And by overriding the fan speed, it looks exactly like he's used to seeing it operate. So it's just a little thoughtful addition we've had. That same capability is in the software. So with us, you can just go to any one of those sites, navigate to it, go to that unit, and you select the drop-down menu and you say, I want to put this unit in cooling stage one and let's see what happens to our temperature. So, a whole big toolkit that's available to the end-use customer, to your service providers, but, but it's, it's just sort of a different sort of philosophy about how you do it. So now the HVAC and controls merge together instead of it's them and it's us and who's got authority and control. We, we try to bridge that gap with the way we approach it.
it's a common, common problem. And the non-proprietary nature is another big deal. You want to have open systems wherever you can. Any other questions? Anybody have other kinds of systems that you have that maybe you have a good um, a kind of a fault detection system in place that you utilize or value? Yes, sir. Would you have a, a, a selfie that has, say, four different brands of RTU at four different ages? Is this going to be able to learn to work together with all these, you know, if you don't have, like, beautiful equipment? All <laughs> kind of the same yes. So the answer is yes. So we apply our product. We've made it so this kit concept, we can go on big units, small units, old units, new units. We've done 28-year-old carrier units and brand new Linux units on the same roof. It's universal in that regard. Part of our process is that before we actually do a job, Design Mechanical has uh, somebody that comes out and looks at the unit and verifies all of our assumptions. And so this, the kit that gets shipped for unit Three is different maybe than unit four or what you have on this building. So we can accommodate every brand from Aon to, I don't know, John Zinks are even out there anymore. But it's a Z. It's a Z, yes. But, uh, but Linux, Train, Carrier, any of them. So it's very generic in that, in that regard. So this, this just shows you what I was showing you on that screenshot. This is a live version here. And so I can go and look at this Bellevue store, this Linwood store, put my cursor over it, and it says we have a drive issue there. And the service switch was left in the off position on this particular unit. And if I want to, I can just click, and it'll take me, give me a little summary view of all the units on this site. This is talking through my phone, by the way. And we got little lights, hard to see, but it says this is a unit with the problem that serves the pharmacy. I got a little tab here that tells me the history of any service issues on this one. And if I want to, I can go live straight to that site and it'll turn white and that means we're going down into the automation world. And it's just gonna list the three rooftop units. This is a drugstore <coughs> chain here. And, uh, and so we can see the fault here is identified here again. We got real-time amp draw, so we're doing measurement verification. We're tracking the energy use of these systems and all the real-time conditions. It's a control system, so we can set up all of our heating and cooling set points. Um, and we have an alarm console, so you can decide which emails you want to get emails on. And then you can do your scheduling through, through the product as well. This is the Walmart application. It's a little bit different. This is, in some ways, kind of futuristic. Because what we're doing with Walmart does not involve any conventional automation protocols at all. It's all database driven. This is the future of, in our belief, of the way that these smart connected devices will work. Um, there's these things called APIs. We're making calls. All these graphics exist. When we go to that location, this is in the Sacramento area of California, it updates with the humidity, temperatures, and all the values of all these units and what they're doing. But it goes out there and it just basically is pulling data out of each controller. Um, and so the controllers are getting more and more powerful. They're not just a slave device that your automation system on a communication bus says, do this, do that, you know, give me the sensor values. But they can store information. Our new Catalyst controller, just finalized by a partner of ours in Silicon Valley, has Wi-Fi on it, right on the chip. So we can go down in a restaurant, go down in a facility, put one of these inexpensive controllers anywhere in a facility, it's another version of the catalyst, and we get all that data into the database. We can now see what those systems and appliances are doing, so it becomes more than just about RTUs. But the way that building automation is gonna be done in the future, it's in a, at least in our belief, is gonna be quite different than the way we practice it today, and that's the way we're doing these Walmart stores. Any other questions? Yes? Well, um, oh, yeah, well, um, I'll leave my, I'll leave my Hillary Clinton email joke alone, all right? Uh, I, I just won't go there, because it'd just be another thing our video guy would have to edit out of my thing. Uh, but yeah, anything, there's always, if somebody wants to get there bad enough, I'm not, I'm not stupid enough to say there's not somebody smarter than I, they figure out how they want to, how they want to, want to get somewhere, but I can just tell you this. 
the, the, the password protections, all the things that have to do the Tritium, which is the main sort of building automation standard these days. They, they were, after they had a breach with Target through an automation platform, everybody in our industry freaked out. And so now what's in place are these, these password protections that are required. We use virtual private networks. We do a lot of sites through cellular with a national deal with Verizon and it's on a virtual private network. So they don't even share the same circuits. Our work at Pearl Harbor, our work with the Long Beach military, the Coast Guard training station, they're using all this in areas that are really pretty sensitive and secure. And so it's, I always say if it's good enough for those, those girls, it's good enough for most of us who are running restaurants or stores or businesses and things. But yeah, malicious people can do malicious things and I have no idea how far they could or would, would go to try to do it. But these are not the kinds of things that most hackers are focused on. <laughs> if they can get your credit card information, that's a different story. But we keep complete insulation and isolation from your existing internal networks. It's just we, we want a dedicated circuit, or we go cellular, or we make sure that your IT group agrees that we have sufficient partitioning here with this virtual private network to safeguard the stuff that does matter. But, uh, but yeah, you know, who, there's crazies out there and I have no idea how far they would they'd go. Any other questions? Yes? What's the average training time to use this? <laughs> Well, usually we get it done in one training, and a lot of it is that you're, you're, uh, we'll, we are partners who spend as much time with customers to get familiar with it. And a lot of it has to do with your depth of knowledge. Are you at the technician level where you really want to go down and change all these settings that we give you access to, or you just want to operate at the higher, higher level? You want to get the alarms, you want to get the alerts and all of that. So, but in terms of the ability to navigate around through a site and all that, it's very intuitive. Um, and so it's just a matter of usually you have an initial training, customer gets some experience, they will follow back up with a few questions that they're, that they're uncertain about. But uh, pretty deep deal, but for the most part, it's all click and point and it's, uh, if there's just certain areas about the system operation you're unfamiliar with, that might be where there's an education required. But these tools are, I think, far more simpler, simple than most automation products because it's designed for the, almost the consumer. It's not designed for the controls guy. Okay? Any other questions? Thank you. I know if you got to go. Sure. So if a facility had five older rooftop units of 20 years of age and, and five of them that were younger, less than five years of age, yeah. or whatever, they had devices on all of them, they could probably replace those older rooftop units, save that device, put it on the newer rooftop unit when you said no. Yeah, them. exactly. Exactly. So that's. Uh, that's what we preach is that we always tell you if you're going to replace the units within the next 18 months, you may not want to make the investment right now on those. You may want to wait, but depends upon the, the energy savings are significant enough typically. It's like why, why wait? Start paying it off now because it is, it's portable. But we always tell people it'll, it'll cost about 500 bucks to re take it from one unit to the other. And so if you're not going to get the energy savings, sufficient energy savings that you would get out of a year or a year and a half, then you might want to wait. But it is portable. And that's one of the reasons the utilities um, like what we do because they care about the, what they call the life of the measure. And if they think you're, oh, well, we're, we do have markets where they say you can't put this on anything over 15 years because they, they're afraid you're going to replace the unit. Then we have like uh, right now in New York, we have a program just for our product in New York through NYSERDA and it's 20 years. So if it's anything over 20, they won't give you the incentive or you can come at them through a custom thing, but they'll just give you 2,400 bucks a unit to put our product on as long as it's under 20 years. So yeah, it, it is an important question because you don't want to throw the investment away, that's for sure. But it's because more and more people are using our product as their controls platform, they want it on all the systems, and so you kind of want to stay in that environment going forward. Any other questions? Yeah, Mike. Uh, I, I know uh, California is always leading the charge. And yeah. I know that with the automatic fault protection, that the, what I heard was that uh, their Title 24 is mandating this automated fault protection. That's right. What are they? Yeah, I'll, I'll show it to you here. So there, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a phrase or, a, or a, a statement that we often hear, at least on the West Coast, but as California goes, goes so goes the rest of the nation eventually. So um, I'll show you some staple stores. Have, probably here in five years or so. 
Yeah, it takes a while depending on the market. So what California has done is they, they understand this issue of fault detection is very, very critical. And so uh, let's go to this unit right here. So this is, uh, I can't remember what town this is in, but it's in Southern California. Let's see, does this have, that's the setting tab. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go to, I'm going to have to go to a different store here. Let's try this one. And then we'll pick a unit. We're going to try to find an example of California Title 24. There we go, economizer. So this is our latest, greatest little graphic. It shows the real-time energy use is going on right here and different temperatures and settings, what the unit's doing. But under economizer, we have this. So if you don't know what an economizer is, it's the damper arrangement that's on the airflow side of the unit that says we can use outside air when it's a, a, a cooling asset and return air, we'll just recirculate air when it's not. It, in some, you, and there's usually a minimum position of outside air that the ventilation codes require. In California, in many markets, outside air is really, um, it's an important part of the efficiency strategies there because it doesn't get really humid. It can get hot but it's generally an economizer friendly market. Now, we've done installations in Miami Beach. We've done installations in Texas. Getting ready to do some sites actually for AT&T in Austin, Texas. Totally different world down there because the humidity is so bad, especially when you get to um, areas like Florida where it's, it's almost tropical, or Hawaii. We did all the Whole Foods in Hawaii. The economizers there have limited value but in California, this is a big deal. So when you buy a brand new unit, so in, in, in uh, this gentleman's example where he's talking about I've got some older units and then I'm going to replace them and I'm going to have some newer units. In California, if he's buying those new units, they have to come with California compliant fault detection. And it also has to come with a really low leak damper arrangement on the economizer. And it has to be demand response capable. So the Catalyst, our product, is one of three approved products in the state of California. The other is Honeywell makes a product called the Jade. It's an econo digital economizer controller. And then Belimo, most known for making actuators, they make an economizer controller called the Zip. So we're the three approved products as what they call an advanced digital economizer controller. So in California, they could buy, as this large church just did here a couple months ago, by code minimum units, like there's 49 state units and then there are California units. They could buy a 49 state unit, save about five grand because it's not cheap with this new energy code in California, and they could put our product on it and meet the Title 24 energy code of California because we meet all these requirements, so I'll explain. Um, the option is, and then on anything that we do going forward, it will include this, even though it's not mandated in a retrofit. So what do we have here? There are really five different conditions that we're, that we're looking at that are a part of this fault detection status. There are, what, eight, seven buttons, seven little lights here. So this unit's all doing, doing just fine. But three of these are related to sensors. So. The first one is, is the unit economizing when it shouldn't? In other words, are we using outside air when we shouldn't be using outside air? Because outside air right now isn't our friend, but the unit's, so light turns red. Uh, it's not economizing when it should. Damper not modulating. Excessive outside air. When the dampers uh, leak, as they do, you can say, I want to close the outside air completely and you end up with 20% of, of, of the airflow for the unit still coming through your outside air damper, that leakage, leak, that leakage is pretty severe. And they want to know that in this new fault detection requirement. And then this is just showing sensor values and then if we go out of range, then we'll identify one of those three sensors as being problematic. Now the question is, how does this all get enunciated? The Bolimo product, the Honeywell product, enunciate through a screen, an LCD screen, on the controller itself inside of the HVAC unit. So the only people who would know if you had an economizer failure 
would be a technician on the roof looking at that, or if you happen to be a facility engineer, <coughs> sufficient skill to go and look at it, and then it would tell you. The difference between what we do in, and what they do is that we enunciate this over the web. So you get an email or you, you get an alert that you actually have a problem and it shows up in your interface that you have it. But Calif this, is, this is related to economizers. Eventually, this will become sort of standard. There's additional fault detection that we're working on with the, with the Department of Energy that goes back to, uh, let's see if I bring it up here in the slides. Let's look at this here. So we've proven this, we've done this in the field now. Um, we did this on some sites in Arizona and, and, and some of the systems in our own office. But basically, uh, we're working with the Department of Energy in the Pacific Northwest National Lab. We deployed this, all the data's been done. We got a contract and it's actually over now. But what's this about? Well, this is refrigeration side fault detection. So um, most of our fault detection focuses on the air side and the economizer side. And if there's a fundamental cooling problem, we can tell these seven different things through the use of just temperature sensors. Now ordinarily in our industry, those of us who work with these machines understand how important it is to know the pressures in the system. But when you put a pressure sensor, a transducer or something on an existing refrigeration system, you expose a potential for leakage. Losing refrigerant, which means you have a low charge, it causes other problems. There's this whole litany of things that happen, not to mention the EPA looking over your shoulders. So um, we've made a decision at Transformative Wave that we don't want to penetrate the refrigeration circuit. So this suits us very nicely, but we can do with it's basically four temperature sensors. We can tell you and see if I get these right. We can tell you if, if you have a dirty condenser, if you have a dirty evaporator, if you have a low charge, so an undercharge, an overcharge, non-condensables in the refrigerator, so if you get air in the system, if you have a clogged metering device, or an obstruction in your metering device, or if you have bad valves. All these, these seven different, did I pass? Yes. Thank you. So these seven different faults on the refrigeration cycle can all be determined with four temperature sensors strategically located on certain parts of the refrigeration system and, and, and they can tell you that. If I showed you, and I, I have the thing I, I could show you, the formulas associated with deriving it. It's one thing to identify the, that you have a problem. It's another thing to distinguish between those seven things just using four sensors. This was all developed out of the University of Purdue. And uh, it's a kind of thing that will eventually find its way into what we call embedded fault detection. So fault detection happens two ways. The manufacturers put fault detection into their equipment when they make it. Or it's field deployed. So we're on that field deployed side. Train or carrier or Lynch. York has a brand new unit that's coming out that has some of this capability built into it. Now once again, um, a lot of it gets articulated at the unit level up in the machine, but it has back net capability. So if you have back net through your tritium control system like uh, Design Mechanical um, deploys, they will be able to articulate these faults for you through their automation system. And we will do the same through our, through our kind of um, um, sort of more canned approach. I'll just tell you the problem with a lot of this stuff and with fault detection overall. It's one of the challenges here. This kind of goes to sort of the findings, so I'll get to it on the last one. So this is what we've learned from our experience in, in, in the field and dealing with um, billions of points of data now that we've analyzed related to these HVAC systems. And this is the first one. Things are worse than what we think they are. When it comes to things on a roof, machines on a roof, out of sight, out of mind, generally speaking, things are worse than what most operators realize. And the sad thing is that most of it's preventable. If you knew it, I always tell customers, especially big ones, the biggest problem that you have isn't the wasted energy from the way you run your fans that you don't have VFDs or you don't have our product. The biggest problem you have is what you don't know. It's the not knowing that's hurting you. 
And that's where automated fault detection and diagnostics capability. We're taking these machines and we're moving them from the darkness into the light. We're taking them from obscurity and we're making them visible. We're, we're graphically telling you what's going on with systems that in the past have just been, been these mysterious assets on the roof that you just cross your fingers or hoping it'll work. And you'll know when it breaks. That's how you know when something's wrong a lot of times. But if you knew, you'd do something about a lot of this. And that uh, reliance on building management control systems has been kind of proven to be inadequate. It's not that building control systems can't uh, be useful. They, they, but they're usually a pull and not a push, if you follow me. They, they require an operator, a trained operator, to be able to know to go out and use it and do the diagnostics and kind of get there in some cases. But automated fault detection and diagnostics changes that reality because it, all the things that a person would do in his mind, we can write the sequence for that. So we do the same logical steps in software and then we serve up the findings to you in ways and that's a push out to you as an operator rather than, um, than having to go look for it. Um, even those paying for a facility monitoring service are subject to much of the same. So we work with some large customers that are paying third parties to monitor their automation systems for them. And I just tell you, that's not, that's not a panacea. Just because you're paying somebody to monitor your systems doesn't necessarily mean that everything's okay with your equipment. The majority of deployed rooftop units lack advanced features and those that do have fault detection are not leveraging it. So 10%, this is a little fact, 10% of all the HVAC equipment that's purchased commercially is less than code, is, uh, is above code minimum. So that means 90% of what gets deployed. You can say, I'll just tell you, I've been in meetings with, with the trains and the carriers and all these people. They object to the fact that the Department of Energy calls our product advanced rooftop controls. Because they're like, what's advanced about it? We can do this stuff. We build machines that do this. We can buy a, a machine with a VFD from the factory. You can buy our boards with our new equipment. Why do you keep calling this stuff advanced? We have it. The, well, the, 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 the point is, it's not about what the manufacturers make. It's about what gets purchased. It's about what's in the field. And because these systems are largely first cost driven, you don't buy those systems because you're not going to pay an extra three grand or five grand to have those features. And what's nice about the way we happen to be able to go to market in most parts of the country is that the utilities will pay us for our product and buy it down. In the Pacific Northwest where we're at, new rebate, they pay 70% of the, of the cost. And I just uh, priced up, had a call right before this started with, with one of my salesmen. We got a problem. If we took the rebates, the rebates, are enough to cover the entire cost of the project. In other words, we'd be happy with just what the, the utility will pay. We'd make all of our margin, we'd have a really nice project, the customer would have zero out of pocket. But the utility says we will only pay 70% of the project costs. So we have a dilemma. We take the rebates to get all of the energy, the, all the, you know, the energy savings are worth X amount. So do we leave money on the table and not take all the rebates? Or do we take all the rebates and now the customer's got, so we either end up with this really high margin opportunity, which is not what we're going to do, or we get creative as we will do with this large um, sporting goods chain in America and say, let's use, let's get all the money and we'll credit you the difference on the next deployments we do because most markets aren't this lucrative. When we come to Kansas City, this is not one of the most lucrative markets we're in from a utility standpoint in terms of support. We're meeting with utility folks later today and we're trying to do our best to help get more um, momentum in this market with bigger, stronger incentives like we're seeing in many other states. But the point is, the savings are real enough and powerful enough, we got people who would pay 100% of the cost, but they put this arbitrary 70% limit on it and it creates a bit of a problem for us. So. Um, the, the, it helps to validate that the savings are kind of kind of real and all that. But when you've got, they will not pay 70 to 100 percent of the cost of you to buy those extra features in a new unit. Is my point. So just because they're there doesn't mean that the economics favor them. 
And then, and then bottom line is, is that customers are rarely interested in investing in features that cannot be cost justified in the short term. And that's just the laws of economics, that's the way that the world works. There needs to be a return on investment. So when I showed you that with four sensors per circuit that we could tell you all those things about your refrigeration cycle, the cost to deploy that isn't just the sensors. Our controller can take that data in. The problem is the labor it takes to do it. It's not cost effective right now in a retrofit standpoint. I don't really see that being a field deployed fault detection. I see that as more of a factory level OEM solution in the future. But it does give you an idea of just how much additional information you could have through advanced fault detection and diagnostics. So we're at the end of our time here. I want to thank you all for your attention. If you have any other questions afterwards, I'm going to be sticking around. I have business cards. The folks from, I know Mike kind of heads up this effort here locally. They're available to give you free demonstrations of our product. We have lots of customers, somebody just like you, uh, somewhere in the country um, in all likelihood. And we'd love to be able to, to give you a demonstration of what we do or find out about the other services that Design Mechanical has because our product is not for every kind of HVAC system out there, even though we do a lot of customization. But you're in good hands with these folks. So thanks again for the invitation.